Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon, good Kelly. Mark, good to see you. Very good to see you. There's another M there. Is that Mark Lewis? Can't tell. Uh, hello, yeah. hello, Kelly. Los Felipe's there. Yeah, very good. Felipe, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah. Well, I think that it's 12.02, or if it's not 12.02, it's awfully close to 12.02. Have you guys got 12.02? Yeah, excellent. Well, we'll go ahead and begin. And uh, you can see the preliminaries on there. One of the things we want to do before we ever get on is pray. But let me lead us in prayer in addition to that and see if God doesn't bless us with his, the presence of his spirit in such a way that we come to know him better today. So let me lead us in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming together and looking at scripture. We pray that you teach us today. We pray that you would be present. We'd ask God that your spirit would guide us so that your word would be accessible to us, that we can understand it and be changed by it. We thank you so much for the Apostle Paul, that you appointed him to be a, a servant of yours, and one who takes the gospel to those of us who are Gentiles by birth. So thank you for that and pray that the things that he says to us today through the letter to the Colossians will be meaningful will shape our lives to help us to become more than you want us to be. And Father, I'm so grateful for those persons who are on here, some of whom have been on every week and are um, obviously desiring to know you better and to read scripture together. And for these few minutes, we have a chance to help each other grow. And we pray that that would be something that happens for each one. Help us, of course, to grow in lots of ways and certainly beyond what we do in this study. Uh, but we're grateful for this time together. We pray these things through Jesus. Amen. So I hope that you have come with a seeking heart today. Um, some of you are taking notes. I can see that. I'm grateful for that. And I certainly hope that we learn to read the Bible better as we move on and do our study together. One of the things that I want to say today in terms of knowing how to read the Bible better is this. That we need to let the largest most significant theological principles govern the smaller, more specific matters. And I know that we've said this a lot of times, but it's something that's really worth reiterating. And so something like who God is, that notion helps us understand what individual sentences mean. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that if God is love, if that's a, a basic constituent of his character, then that's going to tell us what to do with a lot of passages that are maybe a, a bit ambiguous to us. And so we don't know exactly what to do with something. If we can just keep in mind that God is love and that ultimately what God is going to do is loving, that's going to take us a long ways toward understanding what it is that he's doing. And it's interesting, even you know, like I, I get asked the question all the time. So what do you think about uh, the violence in the Old Testament? And this, this happened just in the last week. Somebody who's a relatively new Christian wrote me an email and said, you know, I don't know what to do with all of this violence in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, can you help walk me through this? And first of all, I was really grateful for her question because there are many people who just kind of say, oh, that's impossible. Um, either God couldn't have done that, and therefore these things aren't true, or if God did them, then that's not the God that I want to serve anymore, because a God who did those kinds of things isn't worthy of my attention. And I'm really grateful that this relatively young Christian said, you know what, I'm, uh, uh, I'm just wrestling with this, and I want to have answers. And so, you know, we're, we worked on that a bit, we're going to work on that some more in terms of answering those kinds of questions. But if you just stop for a second and say, who is God? What is his character? What's his nature? What is he trying to achieve with humankind? How much does he love us? What does he do in order to show that he loves us? How has he worked in Jesus? All those kinds of big issues about who God is certainly inform and instruct us when it comes to a question like, well, what do we do with the violence of, of, in the Old Testament? Or any number of a thousand other issues. Uh, you know, sometimes verses are just very difficult to discern where exactly they should come out in the way that we apply them. And, uh, you know, what do we do with this in terms of interpreting it? And to, to interpret a verse in line with who God is, with in line with his love, is usually 
a, a very good practice, even if we don't understand. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't do things that would appear to us to be unlo unloving, uh, just the way a child might look at their parents and say, well, you, you, know, you punished me. That doesn't seem to be very loving. But in fact, we all know that it is. And uh, if I if my son is about ready to walk across the street and just before he gets hit by the car, I grab him by the collar of his shirt and pull him back violently. That can be quite a loving act as I save his life uh, through what appeared to be kind of a violent means. So uh, these kind of things need to inform us when we come to specific issues for sure. And I hope that they do. Um, we're going to look at Colossians chapter one, verses nine through 14. I don't know if we'll get, we probably won't get through all of this today, uh, but we will get through some of it. And so we'll progress to this. Okay. So for example, when you look at verse nine, it says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And then he goes on and talks about his prayer for the Colossians. And he had said at the, uh, at the end of verse eight, uh, that we also have this, uh, that they, the Colossians have love in the spirit. And so that's one of the reasons that Paul continues to pray for them because he recognizes the love of the spirit being in them. And he's just so grateful that that's the case. So he spends, obviously, a lot of time praying for churches. And we've talked about this before. He says it earlier on in his letter. And Paul says this I, in virtually every letter. Maybe in Galatians he doesn't, but in virtually every letter that Paul writes, he says something about praying for that church and the fact that he's praying for other churches. And I don't know how often that you do that. Uh, like, some of us might have a home church that we came from. I'm, you know, I was converted at the Hill Street Church of Christ in Albany, Oregon. Does it cross my church, my mind to pray for the Hill Street Church? Honestly, not very often. Um, I don't pray for the Long Beach Church of Christ where I worked for five years. Sometimes I do pray for the church in Victoria, Victoria where I worked for 15 years. But I, I don't normally just stop and pray for churches. And I think that's a mistake. And the fact that we don't pray for the churches of Christ across Canada and their ministry, and, and not just churches of Christ, of course, but the whole Christian movement and the Christian kingdom. We need to be praying about this all the time, and we don't. So in your private prayer life, and I hope that you have one, I hope you spend some time in prayer, uh, talking to the Lord every day. Um, I hope that you, if you have a prayer list, that you put it on your list and say, I'm going to be praying for other Christians, Christians in my church. Christians not in my church, Christians across the globe, Christians in the Ukraine, Christians uh, in parts of northern Nigeria where they're being persecuted. Lots of Christians could use our prayerful support. And I, I pray that you take that seriously. And I hope that you see in Paul that kind of example of one who thought so much about the church that he was interested in praying for it all the time. So that, very important. And, it, and I don't know if you ever think in these terms, but, uh, you know, at some point, Scripture says, you do not have because you do not ask. You don't have because you don't ask. Wow. What, what if we did ask? What if we ask God to bless the church around the world in lots of ways and we did it regularly? Like I've heard some people say that the only thing that stands in the way of revival the only thing that stands in the way of the kingdom flourishing is the lack of prayer to God on behalf of his work in the world by Christians. And just makes you wonder what we could accomplish if we did we need to spend significant amounts of time praying for the body of Christ. So I hope we do that. Um, Amelda Muhammad, you know, um, I don't know if she does this every day, but Melda has a long list of things that she prays for. And she takes, she actually takes the prayer list that's in the weekly reminder. And she prays through that prayer list on a regular basis every day, maybe every day, but she prays through that list. We need to be more diligent about that. And I'm thankful for her example in the way that she prays for the church and, uh, and lots of other folks. And we just, if we did that, you know, what would, what would it be like? So I, in fact, I, I'd be interested in knowing from any of you if you have that kind of prayer life. And I'm not looking for you to brag, obviously. So don't be hesitant. I'm not going to think of you as a braggart or arrogant if you tell me, you know, actually, I pray every day for the church. Uh, it'd be nice to know that because it would be so encouraging.
to all of us who are online right now to know that you do that. So is there anybody who does that, who, who kind of makes it a point to pray every day, maybe through some kind of list, and who actually does pray for the church? Is that part of anyone's devotional life? Well, yeah, Kelly. Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Yeah, no, I I pray at least once a day, but I would I'd have to admit that I don't pray for the church as often as I do, or I should. Um, more, I I would say, you know, for the for the church around the world, for the church, you know, in North America, and for our church in Calgary, probably only weekly, but it's. I, I agree with you. It's very, very important. And um, it's, it's amazing if you start praying for stuff, how often your prayers are answered that you, they aren't necessarily answered the next day, but they are, it's just absolutely amazing how in, in God's way, he, he answers your prayers. I agree. Yeah, who, who knows the ways in which God intercedes in the world that we never see, that we, you know, we never see his intervention. But he's answering our prayer regarding the saints somewhere, you know. Um, I, for some reason, I don't, I guess it's because we've had so many Nigerian uh, kind of guests and people who joined our church from Nigeria or, you know, made some kind of appearance recently. I, I, I've been paying attention to what's been going on with the church in Nigeria. And in Northern Nigeria, they've had a tough time. Uh, the Islamic faith is present in a pretty violent way in many cases. And so it's like, it's not uncommon for someone to walk out of the church building on Sunday morning in Northern Nigeria and find someone waiting to ambush them when they come out of the church building. It's not uncommon. It happens. Uh, and I, you know, I've read about several cases of this recently where uh, you know, violence has been perpetrated against Christians in the name of Islam. And I just think, wow, it would be so wonderful if the Lord would intercede there. And I can't do a whole lot about that. I can't go there uh, and, and prevent that violence. But I can pray and ask God to intervene and to intercede. And I don't know all the reasons why he might wait for us to pray before he intercedes. I don't know why he doesn't act in certain ways, even when we haven't prayed. Lots of questions I probably can't answer. But I do believe that God respects and hears our prayers and at times does answer, almost as if he says, okay, thank you for being faithful. I'm going to respond now. And in his big plan and his wisdom, his governance of things, uh, he he accomplishes those things in response to our prayers. Um, the scripture seems to make that point really clear. And Paul says, Paul says, I never stopped praying for you. I've never stopped. We continually, those are big words, never stopped, continually ask God to fill you. And then goes on to talk about some things that God is to fill them with. So we need to be praying. For... Any other comments about that? Uh, or anybody else want to share? Say that it is good that you remind us uh, that uh, you uh, that we should pray for the church and also uh, also for our pastor. Um, uh, yeah, so um, and also that you remind us to pray that uh, for our previous church. You know, for example, my church in Peru. Um, yeah, so definitely is um, is something that I would like to do more often. Um, another thing is that uh, I, I think as, as a church, uh, we need to learn uh, to pray more also for things that happen happens uh, in the in the world, no? Like uh, any situation, like the situation in, uh, in the uh, about the, the earthquake in Turkey, in Turkey, um, Syria, and all of those places, and in general, no, for uh, to stop the war in. Uh, Yes, I, I always uh, to have that empathy, not just with our surrounding, but also for things that happens in the world. Right. I appreciate that, Felipe. You know, the, 
people always say that like the number one reason that people would give you say you know why don't you pray more almost everybody would say well i'm just so busy you know i, I just can't find the time to spend that time in prayer i have appreciated the people through history who have said you know what prayer is so important that when i find myself really busy that's when i especially need, need to make sure that i pray and so, you know, we say we're too busy to pray, but of course the line is, well, we're too busy not to pray because prayer is so effective that in the midst of our busyness, that's, it's our prayer time that we take and set aside that may well save us through all of our busyness. So it's, it's important. It's crucial. And we need to be doing it Kelly, for sure. Kelly, yeah, let, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's something that I've noticed lately, and I, I'm going to make the comment that I want want your reaction to you whether think that's positive or negative um when i see a problem and i want something to happen for somebody or to somebody i have a tendency to be specific on this is god this is how i want you to solve this problem or address this and uh god always has answered it and he has a better way so i my prayers lately have been more general as in bless this person with the idea that, you know, far be it from me to limit you because I want you to do this A, B, and C for this person. <laughs> and yeah. God has a better way of doing it. And so I, I guess, I, I don't know if that's a positive or negative, but that's what I've been doing lately. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's a problem with praying for things that are quite specific. Um, as long as we recognize that ultimately, not only is God going to do his will, but we want him to do his will. And so just like you said, like I could pray for all kinds of things that if they actually got answered the way that I want them to be answered, it would be a huge mistake. I'm just not, I'm just not wise enough to know that. And so I certainly want God to do what, you know, the, what he's going to do. Um, you know, the, the, the place for that is most readily apparent, obviously, is in the case of healing. You know, someone gets a disease that we are you know, that we're convinced that if they're just left to the to the world by itself, if God doesn't intervene, you know, this person is in trouble. And so we often, I think very rightfully so, you know, we'll say, well, Lord, your will be done. And I and we want the Lord's will be, to be done. But I don't have a problem with saying, Lord, I really want so-and-so to be healed. In fact, you know, I want you to take this cancer or whatever it is right away from them and give them 50 more years. Would you please do that? Because that's my will. That's what I'm really hoping that you'll do. Uh, but then, you know, I do that obviously with the attitude that, but God, you may have a better plan. And there may be things happen because God, who does not look at death the way that we do, uh, you know, because God, God may say, well, you know what? Actually, if I take this person now home with me, it's going to be way better off. Maybe for everybody, you know, or maybe for the whole world, something significant is going to happen because I took this person now as, a pers as opposed to allowing them to live another 20 years. Yeah, 20 years goes by, they might do some good things, but there's going to be something happen if they pass away now that's going to be actually even a, a, a greater good. And I, I think, like, I don't think that's, that's uh, naivete to say that. I find that to be faithful. To say, okay, Lord, I am actually going to put myself in your hands, and I'm going to allow these people to be in your hands. And so that's not just me saying, well, I'm going to give God an out in case he doesn't heal or something. No, I, I think that can be done faithfully so that we say, Lord, do, do your will, and we're willing to accept whatever your will is. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, don't we wish that we had the wisdom of God? For, for all these things that we ask for. Well, as, as Paul moves on here, he says some really important things. And um, I wanted us to notice how closely parallel chapter one, verses nine through 12 is to Ephesians chapter one, verses 16 through 19. And so if you want to go in your Bible and just flip back to Ephesians chapter one. And usually when I read this particular passage or these thoughts, I usually go to Ephesians. Like I've read Ephesians chapter one, verses 15 and following, oh, who knows, 5,000 times. I, I don't know how many times, a lot in my life. I have read these verses and I've taught them many, many times to so all kinds of classes, to churches and everything. I, I think these verses are incredibly important, but they find a very close parallel in Colossians chapter one, verses nine through 14. 
And so if you look, um, you know, he's talking in Ephesians chapter one, he's talking again about how he doesn't stop praying for them. Look at verse 16 in Ephesians one. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Well, that's pretty close to what he says in Colossians chapter one, verses nine and 10, in terms of the, uh, the prayerfulness that, that, that Paul has. And then he talks about what he's asking for. And the things that Paul asks in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16, 17, 18, right in there, find a very close parallel to what is in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 or 12 or so. So he says in verse 16 in Ephesians, in chapter 1, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remember you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom. And by the way, that's, that's very Trinitarian. And he does that again in Colossians chapter one. We'll see that in just a moment, uh, or at least I'll put that bullet point up on the, on the PowerPoint here in a moment. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Well, if you look back at Colossians chapter one and look at, uh, in verse the middle of verse nine, he says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, etc., etc." Well, these are, again, pretty close constructions, pretty close uh, prayer thoughts that Paul has about both these people. Are they slightly different? Yes. Uh, but the letter to the Colossians and the letter to the Ephesians are written to two groups of people, both in Asia Minor, about the same time period. Um, and, and Paul's paralleling his thoughts here. You know, did he have one of these letters in front of him as he wrote the other? Maybe. You know, maybe he wrote them consecutively and sent them off, you know, uh, you know fairly closely in proximity to each other. Uh, maybe he held on to one for months before he got rid of it. Uh, but at, at any point, or at any rate, he's, he's just sharing very similar thoughts, which lets you know, well, these are clearly Paul's priorities for the church. And obviously not just for the church at Ephesus or the church at Colossae. He has in mind the church in general, that he wants these things to be part of what we're experiencing. And so he wants the Spirit to give us, as he says in Colossians, to fill you with a knowledge of his will. Like, like we prayed about that or talked about that just a moment ago, Larry. You know, we, we would like very much to have the will of God, to know what God is thinking, what he's doing. We're going to give this over to the Lord and let his will be done. But we would love to know the will of God, uh, which, by the way, our theme passage, Romans 12, 2, talks specifically about that in order that you may know his good, pleasing and perfect will, he says at the end of verse 2. Uh, in Romans chapter 12. So the, uh, Paul is really consistent here in the things that he asks for from God about Christians. So knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding. And I, I might tell you, by the way, um, I had mentioned to you guys before the different religions and perspectives that are kind of getting synced together here. We've used the word syncretism, where, where Paul is combating what these different religions and worldviews and philosophies that people, the Christian, uh, Colossian Christians are bringing together, kind of forcing this into a, a package when Paul would like them to, to, to not incorporate all these things together. And the, the word there for knowledge uh, in verse nine is a form, a form, it's not exactly, but it's a form of the word gnosis, which is the word for knowledge. And you'll note that gnosis sounds an awful lot like Gnostic, Gnostic, Gnosis, they come from the same word. And so we've mentioned before that Gnosticism is in the process of kind of developing here. There was an early kind of precursor, early form to Gnosticism that was present even in Paul's day, even though full-blown Gnosticism doesn't really come about until this early in the second century. But here, there, there seems to be some kind of precursor or early version of Gnosticism that Paul is aware of and that he's fighting against even within the Colossian church. So when he says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through wisdom and understanding, Paul's recognizing 
that they are caught up in this worldview, this philosophical perspective called eventually that, that develops into full-blown Gnosticism in which knowledge is really important. And they wanted a knowledge and understanding of the separation between the spiritual and the fleshly and how all that worked out. And they felt like if they could just get this special knowledge that they would be okay. Um, and there's some sense, of course, even for us, that's true. Like the knowledge of who Jesus is, is extremely important. But for them, knowledge meant I possess the knowledge and there would be a focus on themselves. I possess this knowledge and because I have this special knowledge, there are things that I understand that everybody doesn't. And Paul wouldn't have that attitude at all. What's, what he instead wants is for everyone to have a knowledge of God's will and an understanding of what it is the Spirit's trying to do, what Jesus is trying to do. Quite different than the arrogant person who says, I have special knowledge that allows me to know all, all kinds of truths. So I'm, I'm confident that the reason Paul wants to mention those things in Ephesians 1, and then he comes back in Colossians chapter 1 and mentions them also, he's doing that because he's dealing with a certain phenomenon in the church. People who think they're knowledgeable people who think they have a special kind of wisdom. And Paul is saying, well, I, I do want you to have knowledge. I do want you to have wisdom, but I want this to be the knowledge of his will. I, I want this to be a wisdom and understanding that comes specifically from the Holy Spirit of God and not from the religious systems that you're trying to bring into your faith. Uh, and you're allowing that to impinge on your Christianity in a way that's not productive at all. So I think that's why those passengers are so close. He's dealing with the same kind of things in both. And it's just cool uh, that these, uh, these thoughts are there. And I really like it that he calls us to be knowledgeable and wise and understanding, and that he wants that to happen through the Holy Spirit. And of course, uh, you know, in, in our churches, sometimes we haven't done as much with a spiritual mindset and spiritual wisdom as what other groups have done. And, uh, of course, that can go in a direction that's not healthy. But it's probably far more unhealthy for us to just ignore it. And we need to be much more knowledgeable about the way in which the Spirit works and wants to teach us and guide us uh, than we oftentimes are. So there's a, there's a balance there. But I'd certainly almost rather see us error on the side of allowing God to give us knowledge and wisdom than for us to worry that he might somehow... Uh, give us too much or that we, you know, we're going to take that in a direction that's not healthy. To close ourselves off from it would be a, a real mistake. So, so when we pray then, you know, what are the kind of things that we pray for? Well, Paul here has prayed that we might be filled with the knowledge, that the Colossians might be filled with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And, and that's one of the specific things that we definitely need to be praying about for each other. So. We said a moment ago, we need to be praying for churches, praying for the church, praying for our church, praying for Christians. Well, what are we going to pray about? Not just that they have peace, not just that their ministries are effective. We sure, certainly want to be praying for all those things. But Paul prayed for this. This was his specific prayer. And he prayed it in Ephesians, and he prayed it in Colossians. And it just makes sense then that we ourselves would be praying specifically about, not just in general, but praying about the understanding of Christians that they might have spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding. Um, we won't do this right now. We don't, don't have time. And You can do this on your own, and it would bless you. If, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and you read through verse 18 in 1 Corinthians 1, read through verse 8 from verse 18 down through all of chapter 2. And especially by the time you get to chapter 2, verse 6 through the end of the chapter, you're going to find a ton of discussion there about spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge. And, and what it means to possess this kind of spiritual mindset. Paul talks about the spiritual mind and says that it only comes to us through revelation. Just exactly what Paul's praying for in Ephesians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1. Praying for God's spirit to come and reveal 
knowledge and wisdom and insight, understanding to us. And that's exactly what Paul says in the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians that we can have. And he describes that spiritual mindset, especially when you get to chapter 2, verses 6 through the end of the chapter in 1 Corinthians. You'll find him explaining that spiritual mindset. And it's, it's just something we don't talk a lot about. We, you know, we don't do much with that, this whole spiritual mind that is ours in Christ. Uh, but it is indeed a thing. And we need to, we need to be far more aware of that uh, than what we are. And we would all grow if we were uh, more aware of that. All right. So I, I wanted you also, uh, next point on the, the uh, outline here, I wanted us to just notice all the things in verses 9 through 14 that Paul wants them to possess. And we've, we've kind of spent a long time here uh, already this afternoon focusing on knowledge and understanding and wisdom. But that's not at all what he prays. I mean, that's not all that he prays for. There's a, a number of things. Look at verse 10. So that, he says, you may live a life that's worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Those are kind of two different things. We're going to live well before him and please him in the process. It's interesting, by the way, that that spiritual mind that we just talked about, that is what enables us to live well before him. So verse 10 says, and this would be, in, it's in the Greek as well, verse, that's so that in verse 10, where it starts out, so that you may, that, that's in the Greek as well, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. So he, he prays that as the goal for the knowledge and insight that we possess. We don't have a spiritual mind just so we can be puffed up spiritually. We have a spiritual mind so that we can live the way that he wants us to live. And so our spiritual mindset, our spiritual thinking, our spiritual relationship with Christ is the foundation for all of our behavior, which is interesting. Uh, you know, Christine and I were having a conversation just this morning about the notion of, um, like, why is it that we do the things we do? Um, you know, what was the sin that Eve committed? Sin, the, the sin that Eve and Adam committed in the beginning with the, in the garden was not the sin of eating from a fruit. That's true, but that was more of a symptom. Why did they eat from the fruit? They ate from the fruit because there had been a compromise of the relationship. Eve and Adam were not trusting in God. They didn't have the spiritual connection and spiritual mindset with God that allowed them to say, I don't need to eat from this fruit. Instead, they said, oh, this is going to give me knowledge about everything. I'm going to understand things, is what Satan says to them. Your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to see, you're going to see things that you have never seen before. And so they eat, and in the course of that, they break the relationship. Well, here, this is not much different here. Paul wants there to be wisdom and understanding, but then that relationship that they have with God and understanding him leads them to then behave in a certain way. So they live a life worthy of the Lord based on the connection that they have with the spiritual mind, spiritual relationship that they have with the Lord. And that's, these are just two things there in verse 10. Live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. But then look what it says. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So that you may have great endurance and patience. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, like, I, I didn't add those up just now, but it is amazing the number of things that Paul puts into five verses and catalogs all the results that happen for his children when the Spirit gives them knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Having the spiritual mind is amazing in the impact that it has on our lives. And so sometimes we find ourselves frustrated 
Maybe we're frustrated because we know we sin too much. Or we're frustrated because things are not going as well for us as we'd like them to, and we don't have a very good attitude about it. Or we have a relationship problem, and we don't have, you know, we don't have a good approach to that. Or we look at our futures and we say, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on with my future. I can't seem to get anything to work out the way that I want it to. So all these things are frustrating for us. And I think that Paul is saying, if we possess the spiritual mind, God's spirit giving us knowledge and wisdom and understanding, maybe because we prayed toward that end, and now God has blessed us. When we have that kind of spiritual mindset and, and understanding, there are a ton of things that are going to fall in place for us. And when I say that, I don't mean, uh, you know, we're all going to be wealthy and have everything we want. That's not the point. In fact, it's almost exactly the opposite of that. It's that when we don't have everything we think we need, we don't have every, everything that we think we want. Things haven't turned out the way we think they should. When that happens, we actually have the ability to respond with this spiritual mind, a spiritual understanding, a, a wisdom that goes beyond the flesh so that we can see and understand and experience a, a peacefulness, a satisfaction, a completeness. You know, we talk all the time about wanting to be fulfilled with whatever it is we're doing. And I think Paul is saying that fulfillment lies in these things. And where does that start? Well, it starts with this spiritual connection to God in which he gives us a knowledge of his will spiritual insight and understanding and then all of a sudden a lot of things in the world which are so frustrating we might actually just see as god working his will in our lives james says count it all joy my brethren when you experience trials of various kinds why because the testing of your faith will produce perseverance and steadfastness faithfulness and those things are far more fulfilling than the things that we sometimes look for, that we think are going to be so fulfilling for us in life. Anyway, any, I, I, I've rattled on here for a while. Any responses to all of that? I was wondering uh, if uh, this uh, knowledge um, and wisdom and understanding that the spirits give. If we pray for for our church to have that, for our, for the members of the church to have this, uh, do you think uh, it can be a gift that God can give to a, a person, even if that person doesn't have a, or doesn't do a, it, like you need to to be close with God. To, you need to read the, the uh, 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 his wo his words. That's the you no. Know, if uh, sometimes people just uh, can think on things about the, their problems, about the world, uh, you no. Know, but they 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 are not too close to God. So do you think if we pray uh, to God that God can give can give this as a as a gift for them? Yeah. yeah. You know, Felipe, I don't know that God is going to give it to them as a gift despite their will. You know, like, I don't, I don't know that he's going to drag them into it, kicking and screaming. But I do think that with an open heart that God is going to give opportunity. He's going to give opportunity for growth. He's going to put people in situations and bring other people into their lives or circumstances into, the, into their lives, which are opportunities for them. And they can seize those opportunities and from those opportunities grow. You know, what we do so often is we see, we see those things that come into our lives as, as obstacles and burdens and things that we want to get rid of. And God might be saying, you know what? With that in your life, you actually have a chance to grow. And here, here's an opportunity for you to move forward and to, to grow your relationship with me in a way that can be really productive, both in your life and in the lives of others. 
And a lot of times we just, uh, we, we don't look to the Lord for him to get us through those. We don't look at the challenges as being something positive and an opportunity. And instead, a lot of times we back away from them. It's so easy for us to say, I don't want to have anything to do with that or get me out of here or whatever. When, when the Lord is actually putting us in a position where we can, we can move forward. So isn't it ironic? We pray for wisdom and insight and understanding. And then God puts us in a position where those things could come to us. And we flee, we back away instead of seizing the opportunity. And I, you know, I would say that that's a kind of faithlessness that we don't have enough relationship with God and desire in that relationship to, uh, you know, to allow him to, to pull us forward and to help us to grow. Callie, I don't, I don't, I don't, <coughs> Callie, Callie, I don't know if we're, how am I going to try to say this? I think with what you just said last time, I think we we might be suddenly overwhelmed with fear, or may, maybe we're or with where's this going to lead me, or where's this going to go? Sure. I, yeah, I would agree, Mark. Um, we're sometimes overwhelmed with our fears, for sure. And is that you know is that what God wants for us? Is to be fearful in that way? You know, he, um, in First John we're told that perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And so, you know, we're worried about things, maybe afraid that if I, if I put myself out there, something negative could happen. I'm going to get hurt in some way, or I'm going to lose something or whatever. And God is saying, are you kidding? I'm going to make your cup overflow. I'm going to bless you like you've never been blessed before. And it may be that that blessing is going to come in the form of incredible spiritual wisdom and, and insight. Maybe not worldly blessing, but the, the blessing of a, a strengthened relationship with him. I think you might have misunderstood me, Kelly Kay. I know you're, you're a physical okay, what, buff. Sorry, what are you thinking, Mark? I was thinking a person could be overwhelmed ment mentally that, wow, this is just too much for me to handle or to well, think yeah. or to comprehend. Yeah, no, I think I heard that. I, you know, I think I heard you say that sometimes fear causes us to just not act or you know to to uh respond in ways that aren't helpful at all or not productive they don't move us forward and and what i'm saying is that if we do have the kind of faith in the lord that he wants us to have that fear can be taken away like the, the relationship that we have with god who is perfect in his love for us can actually remove that kind of debilitating anxiety out of our lives um, and, and it may be that he's going to use other means to help make that happen but you know does god want us limping along anxiously in every circumstance afraid to move well of course not kelly also also uh, we we should pray for god to to give us peace yeah absolutely absolutely um we're told specifically to pray about that and that his peace will in fact come. So, I mean, this covers, I, I was just about to text you to say, I've got to go, but um, maybe end on that note because we need to come back to that because, yeah. you know, C.S. Lewis would suggest that, uh, you know, in the, um, uh, what was the book? One of his books anyway, speaks of the fact that war sadly brings people closer to God. Yeah. Conflict brings people closer to God. So we, we need to, a, a lot of our prayers are, are very self-motivated and driven. Um, yeah, you know, he, so. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about him disciplining his children yeah. and that we need to allow discipline to have its fruition in our lives. That's in like Hebrews 12, one and two or something. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's the case. Anyway, uh, we're trying to end this around 1242. Uh, we're close, so let's go ahead and call an end to it today. Thank you very much, everybody, for being on. Thank you, and, Kelly. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks, God bless Kelly. you all. Have, have a good rest have, of the day. You too, Kelly, and keep warm. Okay. <laughs>